In the meantime, if you have your Bibles, I'll ask you to go ahead and start turning or scrolling with me to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, as they head out. God's Word says in, in Proverbs 16, verse 4, says, The Lord made all things for Himself, yet even the wicked for the day of evil. Now, I've shared that during... Uh, our series of what is God doing since we've started in January. But last week in that series, we, we talked about what the Lord said. And does anybody remember what he said? He said it five times, as a matter of fact. The Lord said, woe. That's what he said. And he said, woe to those who deal in evil and iniquity. Those who are self-serving and lack care for their fellow human beings. Specifically, in God's word, he said, Woe to those who are consumed by worldly desires, to those who have unscrupulous intentions. Woe to those who cut or are cutthroat and are cruel. Woe to those who practice degradation. And woe to those who cling to idols. Now, Habakkuk, as we've talked about here for our, our fourth week in a row, was crying, he was lamenting to God about how much he suffers. He went to God asking how long him and his people had to suffer at the hands of the Chaldeans. And God gave him a clear and direct answer. Then, through divine inspiration, we see Habakkuk change his tune, if you will. He, he has a, a new frame of mind so to speak. He begins to hear what God is saying. You see, God will talk to you. And I'm not talking about audibly. I mean through His Word. I mean through song. I mean through sermon. I mean through the words of a brother or sister in Christ. You see, God, I believe wholeheartedly, still speaks to His followers today. And what we saw is Habakkuk changed his mind when he begins to hear exactly what it is that God is saying, even though the answers aren't great in what Habakkuk liked. And he prays a prayer that resembles a song. And it is this spirit-led song of Habakkuk that I'd like to examine with you just for a few minutes this morning. So if you hopefully you're in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. Before we read God's Word, I'm going to ask once again, I'm going to go before the Lord and ask Him to speak to us, and I encourage you to join me as well. Father God, I am thankful so much, as Brother Gage lifted up, for the opportunity to be here, Father, for the people who have come out, Father, and for those who may be watching online now or at some point in the future. Father, I believe that Your words are not just ancient texts written on a page. Father, I believe that Your words are true and are insightful to living life on this planet in modern times. Father, as we read Your Word this morning, I pray that we look at it as a blueprint for living. We look at it as parameters for how the Christian should spend their time and live their life. And Father, as we've talked about throughout this series of dealing with tragedy and dealing with hardship, Father, I pray that we see the formula which you have given so that we know how to navigate the rough waters of life. We know how to uh, work through any obstacle or, or through any adversity we may encounter. And it's simply by keeping and holding to our faith in you. Father, I pray that you speak to each and every one in this house. Father, if there be anyone in here that is in the presence uh, of, of this assembly this morning or watching online who does not know you, Father, I pray that you speak to their hearts. And Father, I pray that they don't cling to this world or their own carnal flesh, but Father, that they reject the world, confess their sins, repent of them, and embrace a life of following and serving Christ. Father, I pray that hearts are revived. I pray the backslider slider is challenged. Father, I pray that all of us walk out of here rejuvenated and refreshed in spirit that you spoke to us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray all of these things. Amen. So Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 1. Here's what God's word starts off with. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shiganoth. O Lord, I have heard thy speech 
and was afraid. Now, you can be a manly man this morning. You could be the toughest woman in the pew. But has there ever been a time that you were afraid? Yes, plenty of times that I've been afraid. Well, here we see that the Lord has spoke to Habakkuk. And his word tells us that the prophet was afraid. Oh, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, and he's speaking to God here, in wrath. Remember mercy. The first point of the text this morning is that the follower of Jesus Christ should call on the Lord. Habakkuk was open and he was willing to hear God speak. See, there's so many times when we go before the Lord in prayer and we go before the Lord asking for things that a lot of times our prayers resemble more of a child's Christmas wish list as opposed to doing what it is that we're supposed to be doing with prayer. That is acknowledging His very presence. That is exalting the fact that He does mighty and wonderful things. That is lifting up words of admiration. And then, and then, we start sharing our hearts about the things in which concern us, the things which preoccupy our minds, the things in which we don't know exactly what to do, and that we need the Lord's help. But even if we don't get the Lord's help, do we remain faithful? Here, Habakkuk was open and willing to hear what the Lord was to say to him, regardless of the answer. He was open and receptive. And when he went to God in prayer, he did so expecting a response. And we talked about that last week, maybe two weeks ago. Prayer is not another form of talk therapy. Prayer is not a way just for you to get your thoughts out and, and, and let it be alphabet soup. That is not what prayer is for. We, you, I, we should be going to the Lord in prayer expecting for things to happen. Because understand, if we go to the Lord in prayer thinking that He has no capability to make it happen, or rather He has no care for the Christian, understand that's a prayer in futility. When you go to the Lord in prayer, are you expecting a response? Are you expecting the Lord to hear what it is that you have to say and what weighs upon your mind and your heart? Do you have a preconceived notion or your own personal feeling of how God will answer you? Or are you just open to what He may do in your life? See, I have, I have come to realize when people say that God isn't speaking to them, when people say that God is no longer working in their life, it's not that God isn't speaking, and it's not that God isn't working. It's simply He's not doing what they think it is He should do. And furthermore, not is it only because He's not doing the things they think in which He should do, but in a timely fashion, He isn't doing the things which they think He should do. How many, mess, how many blessings are missed? How many times has God touched your life and you've taken it for granted? And you haven't even realized it till much later. I'll be the first to tell you, I, I, I have all the time. Not realizing how good God is to us. Answered prayer comes in many forms. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus told us, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That's a guarantee. That is a, that is a promise to the person who truly seeks after God. The one who, who is searching for God's will in their life. That He will answer and He will open and He will give you everything that you ask for according to His will. God answers prayer in many forms. And it can come in the form of a, a metaphorical light bulb going off when you hear or when you read the Bible or listen to a sermon. As I mentioned before, God can answer you through the words of a friend or a stranger, for that matter, during the course of the conversation. God can answer you through ways in which you have never anticipated. But understand this, when you go before the Lord in prayer, are you expecting Him to respond and are you open to any way He may respond to you? 
I read a, an article about a guy named Louis Palo, and, and he was a sports writer, and he shared a kind of a testimony of an NFL player who had such a desire to be used by God. This guy, he, he just, I mean, he's a, he's a minority in that, in that sport because there's not a lot of people, if you listen to their interviews, you read about the conduct of their lifestyle and their stances on things, there's not a lot of NFL players who are trying to be used by the Lord. But he wrote this, he said, NFL running back Sherman Smith stood 6 feet 4 inches tall and packed 225 pounds of the most solid muscle you'd ever want to tackle. His reputation for bowling over linemen raised his celebrity to near cult status in the Pacific Northwest where he played for the Seattle Seahawks. Then, without warning, the Seahawks traded their most popular player to the San Diego Chargers. Went from one bad team to the other. He didn't write that. That was my commentary. He wasn't with the Chargers for more than a few weeks when he seriously injured his knee. And everything changed overnight for this running back, whose Christian faith was as rock solid. And guys, this isn't my words. I want, I want you to know I'm reading from an article here because I don't think I'd ever use this description. Whose faith was as rock solid as his abs. I'm glad my faith is a little bit more solid than my abs, but that's a different sermon for a different day. So everything changed for him overnight, and while in rehab, uh, rehabbing for his knee, he wondered, Lord, why did you ship me to San Diego? Because you gotta, you got to understand, you got to relate. When things are going good, sometimes God asks you to do things that are different. When you're comfortable, God has a way of asking you to step outside of your comfort zone. And that's what was happening here. But while his knee mended, Sherman had the opportunity to lead one of his teammates to the Lord. That converted party guy, a guy by the name of Miles McPherson, has since become an outstanding youth evangelist who reaches tens of thousands of people each and every year. Understand this, God not only answered Sherman Smith's prayer, but he probably answered the prayers of many others because he saw his teammate come to the Lord and now he is effectively winning soul after soul. And all it took was a trade to a different city and a busted knee. See, God answers prayer. Sherman wanted to be used by God, but I guarantee you when he went to the Lord in prayer and asked to be used, he wasn't asking for him and his family to be uprooted and moved to a different city. He wasn't asking for him to be injured and no doubt go through pain and surgery and rehabilitation. He probably didn't ask for any of those inconveniences, but God still used him despite all of the hardship he faced. And what I'm saying this morning to you is in the midst of your storm, in the, in the times of hard when you are in your biggest struggle, God can be answering prayer through each and every one of those things. But are we faithful to remember that? Do we trust Him enough, despite what's going on, that we know He is still working through us and in us and blessing our lives? But you and I, we have to be open to hearing and doing what God calls us to do. Now that's easier said than done, right? It's easier for us in this climate-controlled sanctuary where we're kind of shut off from the world a little bit. It's easier for us to say, you know what, we just simply got to do. We simply got to listen to the Lord and, and, and do what He tells us to do. Because it's when the rubber meets the road when, when that life becomes difficult. The text this morning said that Habakkuk heard the Lord speak and it frightened him, right? It, it said he was afraid. By the way, Habakkuk is in wonderful company here. And I say that because of this. We've seen many men of God hear the Lord and have the Lord move in their lives and they too were frightened. And scared. I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of that. Adam was afraid. If you might recall in Genesis chapter 3, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, people are afraid when they do the things in which God tells them not to do. Amen? Moses was afraid. 
In Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. When you know you're unrighteous, it's hard to look at a just and perfect God. Job was afraid. Job chapter 23 Verse 15, it says, Therefore am I troubled at his presence when I consider I am afraid of him. David was afraid. Think of Psalm 119, verse 120, when it says, My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. You see, I'm of the opinion that a lot of people were actually sharing that fear. Because anybody who thinks that there is a possibility just a small possibility that these Christians aren't all crazy and there might be punishment for the things in which we do wrong. There are plenty of people that are afraid of the judgment of a righteous God. And how many people, instead of looking and focusing on the fact that God blesses us tremendously, more focus on the fact that I just don't want to go to hell and at some point go pursuing God. Now understand this. If they faithfully follow Jesus Christ and it was that fear that got them here, by the way, you should be listening to this. I'm talking to you. You know who I'm talking to. If it's fear that gets you there, then embrace it. But you have to make a decision in your life. You have to make a decision if you're going to believe a world which lies to you over and over again, or believe the book that has not produced a single fallacy. You must make a decision at some point for Jesus Christ. But you see, Habakkuk, he was afraid, and so many people are afraid to take the word of God seriously, because it just might make them look themselves in the mirror. Those who opposed Joshua were afraid. In chapter 2, verse 11, And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. You see, those people who opposed Joshua and the Israelites were so afraid of what God could do, they didn't even see His presence. They didn't even see His work. All they had done is heard of it. They just heard about the things in which God could do, and they were afraid. See, it's my opinion once again, and I'll, I'll tell you the difference between what God's Word says and what my opinion My opinion is that the world has stopped being afraid of what God can do. Many Christians, I believe, as well. Now you might say, Brother Danny, of course all of these people were afraid, most of them. You're talking about people who actually audibly heard God's voice. Amen. What I'm going to say to you this morning is that it doesn't take hearing God's voice audibly to make you afraid. There are many who are afraid to follow his word for fear that they're going to miss out on something that the world has to offer them. There, are, may, there may be some who even fear coming to the altar when the Lord speaks to them because, well, you know, what are people going to say? What are they going to think? What are they going to see? There are some who fear many things. There are some of you who know what God wants you to do. To surrender whatever strong stronghold that has gripped you for so long, yet fear causes you to remain paralyzed, to remain still in your faith. The Christian fears many things, by the way. Some of it looks identical to the unbeliever. They fear the world affairs. They fear, they fear illness, the economy. But where is the fear of the Lord in your life and in my life. Habakkuk called on the Lord and guess what? God answered. Christian, God is still answering His children's call today. 
When we call upon Him, when Habakkuk called on the Lord in these verses, he did so recognizing that God has done and continues to do wonderful things. Remember when I said, when we started together, that we saw kind of a transformation in the narrative of Habakkuk here? Uh, Don't miss the attitude change from chapter 1 to chapter 3. Because you understand when people, everybody, there are books and there's podcasts, there's countless sermons of what's going on in the modern church. I had someone tell me yesterday that you guys are so blessed. And I said, well, why do you say that? He said, because I, I, I can't even get 20 people to come to Sunday morning worship. Understand this. Everybody wants to diagnose the problem with the modern church. And here is, you know, just take it for what it's worth. Here is my thought. We see people who are quote unquote saved. But there's no attitude change. There's no fear of the Lord. We see people who come under the conviction of God. We see people whom the Holy Spirit is ministering to. Yet we see no change. No transformation. Habakkuk changed from chapters 1 to 3. In verse 2, understand this, remember this. He was crying, he was lamenting in chapter 1. But by the time we get to chapter 3, verse 2, Habakkuk, instead of crying about the conditions of the world, the prophet trusts what God is doing. And he goes even further because he says, Revive thy works. Now that word revive there is not to... Not the kind of revive that you and I probably think of when we say it in the church. Like, you know, hey, our church needs revival. Our our community needs revival. Lord knows our country needs revival. It's not that kind of revive that Habakkuk is talking about. It's not the kind of revival like the revival meetings we'll have starting at the end of February. It's not that kind of revival. The word revive here means to keep going. Habakkuk is saying to God, keep your works going, keep them alive. You know what Habakkuk is recognizing? In chapter 1, he's lamenting, God, why aren't you doing anything? God, how long do I have to cry for the destruction and the turmoil that me and my people are going through? But notice the change now. He recognizes that God never stopped working. And he says, you know what, God? Revive thy works. Keep working. I see you working. I know you're working. And Christian, this morning, I will say to you that if you feel like you have a lukewarm faith, if you feel like God is not speaking to you, if you think that God is not working in your life, it's time for a transformation. He went from doubting God even when he hears his prayers, thinking that God had somehow neglected Judah, that that he had turned his back on him. And this is the prophet I'm talking about. He went from there to seeing and realizing that God is at work. But understand this, the prophet was not pompous in this new attitude. He didn't allow it to swell his ego. Instead, he realized the fact that all this destruction and all this violence and all this adversity, all these trials, all these hardships, was God judging Judah. But when he realized that, he didn't go back to complaining. God, why are you judging me? He didn't go back to saying, why is it that you're doing these things? What did he do? He calls on God to remember mercy. You see, you want to know what the difference is of complaining about the fact that things are bad versus asking God to remember you to have mercy on you to show you grace? The difference is is knowing that all of us, you, me, We are undeserving of God's grace. There's nothing of ourselves that we could do to ever make ourselves right in the eye of a righteous God. And maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but every negative thing that happens to me, I probably deserved a lot worse. But Habakkuk is not asking for it to stop. He's recognizing that God is still on the move. 
But he's asking him, please, don't forget mercy. Still petitioning a need and desire, but doing so without questioning the motives of God. That's the transformation we see. You see, we started this series with looking at the fact that it's okay to ask God why. And that's still, that's still true today. But notice the change in attitude. If your prayer life, if your actions or your opinions toward God never change, and there is a constant, let's just say, bargaining taking place, when there is a lack of faith being exercised and a consistent unceasing of, of questioning about what God is doing, there is something more at play. Because if, you, if you're in a constant state of asking God, why, 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 if you're in a constant state, of questioning his motives, then that means you're having trouble exercising faith. It's a heart problem. Because understand this, God does answer prayer. God does work all things out for good. And maybe there should be less questions. Maybe there should be less, uh, less wish lists for God in your life and more prayers for understanding. More prayers for insight. More prayers for guidance. More prayers for God to speak and for you and for I to be open and ready to hear what God is saying. And open and ready to go wherever it is that He may lead. Now, in order to gain that understanding, you must, you and I must reflect on what he has done. You know, I've said this plenty of times in the past. We should never romanticize things from the past. But there's a difference in romanticizing and living in the past versus remembering what God has done for you in the past. Because romanticizing is, is going back and wishing, oh, I just wish I was back there. The music was so much better in the 80s. I had somebody tell me that this morning. That their eight, uh, Brother Junior was telling me that, that somebody, somebody said that. Romanticizing something from the past. No, it's saying, I, I'm thankful that Huey Lewis in the news existed, but I'm looking forward to good music in the future. Amen. Anybody know who Huey Lewis in the news is? Thank you, Brother Max. Thank you, guys. It's hip to be square. Amen. So here, here's the thing I'm saying to you. Habakkuk, we're going to see in his new attitude, what he's going to do is he's going to reflect on what God has done in the life of Israel. The second thing that we should do is we should look and we should contemplate God's work. Now there's a lot of verses here, but we're going to go through them because it, it, uh, we need to be faithful to read God's word in his entirety. Starting in... In, in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 3, here's what God's word says to us. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. By the way, this isn't just some distant past. His ways are still everlasting. Amen. Uh, I saw the tents of cushion and affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation. Thy bow was made quite naked. Didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear, verse 12, thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou uh, woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Selah. 
Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses, through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. We'll stop right there. Can you this morning, without hesitation, And with the utmost sincerity, make the statement, God has been good to me. I know I can. And as you reflect over your life, as you you contemplate God's work, it is amazing how much He has done for you and for I. To be in the spot where we're in right now. That is exactly what Habakkuk is doing in these verses. He is looking back at history and saying, wow, God has really been at work. Proclaiming all the things which God has done for Israel throughout the course of history. No, he's not highlighting every single major event. But what the prophet is doing is giving credit for God's mighty works. And when Habakkuk asked the Lord to revive his works, this is the works that he, these are the works that he is citing. (laughs) He went from saying, Lord, how long do I have to cry? Why aren't you working? To, wow, God, you have done all these things. The prophet knew all the great things that God had done, and he expected God to continue to do them. Habakkuk was surrounded by trouble. A nation that seemed to be crumbling, ripping away at the very fibers of its being. Foreign armies invading. Plenty of reasons for the carnal mind and heart to give up hope. But God's people have endured judgment. Have endured wars spiritual battles, and so much more before. If God was faithful then to bring all of those people from their time of suffering, bring them out of their time of suffering, what makes you think that He will not deliver you in your time of trouble, in your time of sadness, in your time of need? Habakkuk is not just talking about, by the way, his own personal deliverance. What he's alluding to is the perseverance of faith that he has. Now some people don't like that phrase, perseverance of faith. But understand, look at Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14 that says, For we are made partakers of Christ, we being the followers of Jesus, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That verse is telling us that we must cling to, we must hold tightly to the confidence we had for Jesus to save our souls from eternal damnation. Because something strange happens when a person asks Jesus to be their Savior. And in that moment they trust that it will keep them from the heat of hell. But then life begins to happen and somehow that confidence begins To just fall away. What that verse in Hebrews is telling us is to keep that confidence. If you believe that God can deliver you from eternal judgment, why can't He deliver you from temporal hardship? That same confidence should be exercised when the trials of life come. When the mountain seems too steep to climb, when the burden seems too heavy to carry, when your strength feels as if it's going to give out or that it gave out so long ago. Oswald Chambers said this, I've shared this recently, but it bears repeating. Oswald Chambers said, faith for my deliverance is not faith in God. Faith means whatever I am visibly delivered or not, I will stick to my belief that God is love. There are some things only learned in a fiery furnace. Habakkuk is recalling all of these events through Israel's history. 
And for time's sake, I'll just show you a couple. I'll show you a couple of these events that the prophet is mentioning. In verse 6, Habakkuk talks about the mountains moving, uh, uh, which imply, or rather, which is shown throughout the Old Testament several times. Here are just three examples of this. In Judges chapter 5, verse 5, God's word says, The mountains melted before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 24, God's word tells us, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. Nahum chapter 1, verse 5, The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned in his presence, the world and all that dwell therein. In verse 8, Habakkuk is asking what God had against the waters because there obviously was some type of supernatural displacement. If you look through God's Word, you will find that it was at the Red Sea and it was at the Jordan River where the Israelites were permitted to cross on dry land only, only because of God's intervention. And the reason why I just want to highlight that point is because right now, in 2000, well, the last one I saw was about 2019. But within the past three years, there are people who are trying to find a quote-unquote logical way that Moses and the Israelites could have went through the Red Sea. There are people who are trying to figure out how the Israelites went through the Jordan River with Joshua. And you know what's funny? Is that for a book that they try to discredit, and for a God they claim does not exist, they spend so much time and effort trying to prove how natural things could have allowed this to be, oh, well, maybe the sea was shallow at this particular time and they could have just walked through it. No, I believe God's word is clear. God intervened and His people were delivered. God, uh, verse 11, we'll keep going. Discusses the sun and the moon standing still, which is an obvious reference to what took place in the book of Joshua. If you don't recall that, I'll give it to you. Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Then spake Joshua to the Lord uh, in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Yasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about the whole day. Yes, call me crazy, but I believe that God's people needed a victory. And they only had so many hours of light left. So yes, I believe that God's people cried out and God just didn't come down and wipe out an army. He didn't just make them uh, have super strength like a superhero. No. He answered their prayer for letting the moon and the sun stand still until He could finish what He had started with them. When the times are difficult, we must never forget that God is good to us. You see, Habakkuk is reminiscing on all these wonderful things God had done in the life of the Israelites. And folks, I can tell you that if you were here in the house this morning and you're breathing, God has blessed you. Blessed you In this country, which may not be perfect, but is one of the best, if not the best, in the world. And that's not nationalism. That's fact, my brother. He has pleased, or excuse me, he has blessed you with a life to serve him and others. He has blessed you with people who care and love for you. And understand this morning, if you're saying, Danny, I'm, I'm not for sure that anybody really truly cares for me or loves me. 
look no further than your brothers and sisters here at Grace Rural Baptist Church. Because we love you. Yeah, we may not always see eye to eye. Yeah, we may have disagreements that arise. But that doesn't mean we love you any less. God is so good to you and I. And when times are difficult and you wonder exactly what it is that God is doing, remember all that He has done for you in the past because He is still working. Psalm 46 verses 8 through 10 say this, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations He hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, He cutteth the spear in sunder, He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. When you think about, when you look over, when you contemplate all the things which God has done for you, your family and beyond, it is impossible not to somewhat be thankful for it. Somewhere deep down, knowing what He has done in your life and being thankful. That brings us to our third point this morning, which is commend and celebrate What God has done. See, we've contemplated it, but don't just stop at thinking about it. Amen? Just like if God leads you to do something, you don't stop at thinking about it and contemplating it. You execute it. But when we think of the things that God has done in our lives, we shouldn't just stop at reminiscing. We should praise Him for it. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19 say this. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, Neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive tree shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Those are bad things, by the way, if you didn't catch that. And despite all those bad things happening, look what the prophet says. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and He will make my feet like hinds feet. And He will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer of my stringed instrument. So, oh my, what a change. What a change we have seen in Habakkuk over these past four weeks. He is writing that even though all these things happen, plants may not blossom, trees may not yield fruit, he still rejoices in the Lord. We started this series on the first Sunday of January, and, and I said this may seem like an unusual set of scriptures to start a new year off. Because traditionally, people are going to people are going to talk about setting goals, right? Pastors are going to preach a positive message about about what you're going to do this year and what the church is going to do this year. And as much as I fought it, I you know, I God God kept me right here. And as we began this new trip around the sun here about four weeks ago, the fact of the matter is, is the book of Habakkuk is uplifting to those who put their faith. In Jesus Christ. Because the follower of Jesus knows that bad times will come. That things will take place that will make you feel as if everything is out of control. The winds of change blow so violently that at times it seems impossible to catch your breath. But guess what, Christian? You can rely on Jesus. You can still rejoice in the Lord. You know, it talked about... God giving him strength. And in Philippians chapter 4, very familiar set of scriptures, but scriptures, but Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13 say this. Not that I speak of respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. That means even where you're at, if things aren't that hot in the moment, be content. Because God still delivers. 
I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Habakkuk came to the realization that he could not get to this place on his own strength or will. Instead, the prophet finally conceded to the fact that with God's strength, there was no hardship that was too difficult. There was no trial that was too troublesome. There was no mountain that was too high. Because if God was with him, he would be okay. And I'm saying that to you this morning. If you're following Jesus, he's right there with you. And you'll be okay. Psalm 115. Well, let me, let me back up before I get there. The series title and the overall question that we've been discussing for the past four weeks is, What is God doing? Because there are times in our lives we look at the world around us, we see the things going on, and we say, What in the world is God doing? Why isn't He intervening? Why hasn't He come back yet to rapture His church? What is God doing? Well, the answer lies in the 115th Psalm. And I told Brother Joey when, he, when I gave him the title, I said, this sounds like the most rude title in history. Take it up with God. Because in His Word, here's what He says. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased. Not what we hope for or what pleases us but what pleases God. We cannot dictate to God or attempt to control the outcome. The Lord will do what is right, right and just and pleasing to Him. And where does that leave you? Where does that leave me? Where does that leave the Christian? Someone once said that if you were riding a bike into the wind and then stopped and turned around, you might think that the wind changed because it went from hindering you to helping you. But in actuality... The wind didn't change. You did. Your reaction to the happenings of this life is more critical than anything else. What this book of the Bible shows us is that the Christian should know how to deal with difficulty. Regardless of the problem's origin. Rather it be of, poor, of the poor exercise of free will or a test from God. You know how to deal with such struggle. And it's five easy things to do. And if you haven't listened to anything in the past four weeks, here's the part to listen to. The next time a problem comes, here's what to do. Take your burdens with an honest and open heart to the Lord. Call upon His name. Converse with God about what is going on. And third, wait a, wait a time with patience for God's response. While waiting... Be preoccupied with prayer and meditation on God's Word. Fourth thing. When God speaks, be sure to follow. And not just hear His response and think, Yeah, I wish I'd have got a different answer. I don't exactly think that's the best option. Do so without hesitation or negotiation. Go where He, he leads. And fifth, no matter what, never stop rejoicing in your salvation. For it should be the greatest joy in which you possess. For the problems of this life will fade away so quickly and someday we shall meet Jesus and all of your bad times will be worth every millisecond of it. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the book of Habakkuk which shows us that at times we will get discouraged and we will get downtrodden and that it's okay to cry out to you and ask why. But Father, thank you for showing us that it is in those times when we must rely heavily upon you, even more so. And Father, it is in those times, it's <laughs> those times we should look back. Look back upon our life and see the ways in which you have intervened for us. Father, you are worthy of praise for every single... You are worthy <laughs> of praise for just allowing the earth to rotate and for the sun to rise this morning. You're worthy of praise for each and every heartbeat this morning, for each and every breath we take. 
Father, you're worthy of praise of this ministry here at Grace. You're worthy of praise that all of us have people who love us. Father, I pray that no matter what we're faced with, we never neglect the remembrance of your mercy. And Father, I pray that it is our desire for us to cry out to you and say, just like Habakkuk, revive thy works. Continue what you're doing, God, because we trust you. We may ask why from time to time. But we'll live by faith. And Father, I pray this morning that all of us are faithful enough to pray out to you in praise and adoration. And not just for our own personal our own personal needs, our own personal wants, but Father, rather for the needs of others. Father, if we believe in You and we trust in You, then we know that there is not a single thing that we require that You will not take care of. And I pray that we approach You this morning with that attitude of knowing that you will indeed intervene in every single situation. And as we set out, as we look upon this year ahead, Father, we do so with a renewing of our faith. We do so rejoicing in our salvation and desiring that those who are unsaved know that peace which we possess. And Father, that we personally share our testimonies, that we share Your Word. And Father, that we are busy about winning souls and growing closer to You. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen.